This is Catherine Parker from The Haunting of Hill House. You're listening to Derek Thomas and the Monday Morning Critic Podcast. Hey, this is comedian Jim Florentine, and you're listening to the Monday Morning Critic Podcast. He taught me, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. I said it before, and I'll say it again. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. Good morning, Vietnam! Keep the change, you filthy animal. So you go on and stamp your form, Sonny, and stop wasting my time. Because I tell you the truth, I don't give a shit. You don't know about real loss. Because it only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. So if I'm not black enough, and if I'm not white enough, and if I'm not mad enough, then tell me, Tony, what am I? My name is Borat. Da, 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 da. Hey, I never asked you. Yeah. You like guacamole? You're the smartest guy I ever met. And you're too stupid to see. He made up his mind ten minutes ago. That's what I do. I drink and I know things. My next guest is an American novelist. He's written for many, many major publications, uh, including Esquire, Forbes, SI, New York Magazine. His his books include uh, Deepwater Blues, his newest book. We're going to talk about that. Mortal Games, The Last Marlin, The Dream Merchant, and the absolutely wonderful book that I love just as much as the others, but touched me more than than most books that anybody has written, uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer. His name is Fred Waitzkin. Fred, how are you today, my friend? I'm great, and that, that was a very a very nice introduction. Thank you very much, man. Yeah, and so I, I got to say, man, so every time I have a, I have many authors that come on the show, right? So every time I ask a question like, you know, who's who inspired you, who is – and I know what your answer is going to be, but other authors, I swear to God, I hear the name Kurt Vonnegut more than anybody. I don't, I don't know why. I mean, is can you help me with that? Why do most authors just find – Inspiration in Kurt Vonnegut. I can't. I can't. You, you know, you, the first question you asked me, I can't answer. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I never loved Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut. You know, I mean, I, and I, I felt guilty about it for a long time because I tried to get into those books and they just didn't speak to me. I mean, it's so idiocra- idiosyncratic, the, the books that we love when we fall in love with it. It really is like falling in love, falling in love with women. You can never tell. Right. But he wasn't one of my, he wasn't one of my favorites. Uh, but, but to answer the question that I think you were getting at, um, and maybe you knew the answer to, um, Hemingway was the guy for me. I, yes, I, for sure. Yes. I, re- I read him first when I was 13 years old when my mother gave me Life magazine, and I just fell in love um, with the story of this old man fighting this larger-than-life fish in the ocean, and, and the rhythm, the prose rhythms of his sentences were intoxicating. So I got this idea when I was a kid that... Um, Fishing and great literature was somehow connected, and I've never quite gotten over it. But that, you know, but I've, I've loved many authors, um, but Hemingway was where it started for me. Well, you know, and, and heck with other authors, let, let's talk about you, because your life is just, I mean, I did research on it like I do everybody else, and I just, the more I dug, the more I was like, I want to dig more, and I want to find out more. I mean, it was just more compelling after... So I have to say, you're born in Cambridge. I mean, um, you. How long were you in Cambridge for before you go to New York? Was it a long time? Uh, a little bit. How how often were you? How long were you in New York for? I mean, uh, sorry, Bob, Cambridge for. I, I I was I was really just a baby in, in Cambridge. Uh, my dad um, ran and owned this very small lighting business, um, and we moved out of Cambridge when I was four years old and moved to New York. Um, but then, but then. You know, later on, you know, my dad moved back to to Boston and moved back into the house that he'd lived in in Cambridge. So I visited the years, um, but really, I grew up in Long, in Long Island and in New York. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I, people all the time say how much their father means to them and the importance of their dad. And many times, it's just you know words. But with you, Fred, it's a whole different thing. Like, you absolutely adored your father, Abe. I mean, he meant, the, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but he meant the world to you and, and still does. Uh, he did. He was, you know, um, he was a great inspiration for me. I, I, I'm sometimes asked about my um, literary influences, and, you know, I just mentioned Hemingway, but probably my largest um, literary influences are my mother and my dad, because mm. my dad was this lighting salesman. Um, and, but he was a really great salesman. I mean, he, 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 during the 50s, he, uh, 
he, he provided the lighting for all of these giant buildings in New York, like the United Nation building and the Ciccone Mil- Mobile building and Aqueduct Racetrack. And I just, I saw, and in my fantasy of him, I thought that he lit the whole city of New York, that you'd look at the skylight and you'd think that that was my dad's work. And my mom, she was an abstract painter, and she did this work. Um, she actually got, you know, after her death, about 13 years ago, she be, she's kind of gradually become quite famous. And her work is in all the top museums uh, in the United States today. She wasn't when she was alive, but it was one of those stories, after you die, you become famous kind of stories. Sure. And my, par- my parents didn't get along with one, uh, one another at all, but they were great literary influences for me. You know, like on the one hand, this dynamic businessman, salesman father, and this artist mother, and this kind of resentment between the two of them, and kind of riding riding the rail between the two of them. They were, they were great inspirations to me um, in my work. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and I don't want to get too deep here, but I mean, your dad was in and out of, and if I'm if I'm misspeaking here, please correct me. Um, uh, in and out of hospitals, I, I think he might have even battled an addiction. Um, so life for him wasn't completely. I mean, not not like it's easy for anybody else, but he battled some things that were were were, were clearly tough on him. Is that a, is that an accurate statement? Tough on him, tough on tough on me. Right. I mean, tough on my bro- my brother. Mm-hmm. It was it was. You know, life is challenging for everybody. Sure. But it was very, it was particularly challenging for me to have a father that was kind of dying my whole life, and it kind of like um, invested me with um, a sense for mortality from a very young age, and in a sense, mortality has been one of my themes throughout my writing life, mm. and I think that is in do, do in part. For the, you know, I always thought I was going to lose him, I and mean, he was always going to the hospital, uh, starting from when I was five or six years old, and I never thought he would come out. Um, but he survived again and again. He was a brave, tough guy. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I get that. And in some way, somehow, he seems to find, and you mentioned this, he finds his way into a lot of your writing, right? He finds his way in there, and it, it's clear it's, 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 it's because he's a huge part of, of, of who you are today. Yeah, he does. It's true. I mean, you know, like, my, the, he's part of my male protagonist. You know, I... I, I, I became intoxicated with salesmen um, when I was a young guy and kind of the wheeling and dealing of business and the dark side of business was very intoxicating to me, I suppose, because of my father. My father was no angel. And, um, and so, yes, the protagonists in my, no- in my novels, uh, they aren't my father exactly, but there, there are qualities of, of him in them, to be sure. Uh, and another one of the things that finds their way way into your book, uh, Fred, is, is 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 a lot of the family dynamic, right? I mean, uh, we, we talk about that, and, and people throw that around, but um, it's clearly, um, especially with your with your son, with your grandkids. I mean, I, I don't want to sound like master of the obvious here, but it's clearly something that means a lot to you. Yeah, I mean, fam- family means the world to me, and um, you know, I I I, I guess. I mean, my, you know, what kick-started my writing career, um, which you alluded to so beautifully in the beginning, was searching for, for Bobby Fischer. And it was a cool thing to be writing about, um, um, presumably, the chess world and, and, and chess players and a brilliant chess-playing son um, when I published that book a lot of years ago. But really, the reason it was so popular wasn't because I was writing about chess but it was because I was writing about family and the dynamic of family, and chess was kind of like weaved in and out of it. But the family dynamic, as much as anything, was what that book was about. Mm. And so family has done a great deal for me as an author. No, that's well said. And, and you know, I was watching interviews with you and your son. I was watching inter- a bunch of stuff you've been on, whether it's on television or YouTube and so forth. And I swore to myself, the one thing I am not going to ask Fred that he seems to be asked every forum he goes to is, what do you do when you get writer's block? So I'm not going to ask you that question. I'm not asking it because I know I, I've heard your answer, and I feel like you get asked that question a lot. Does that ever get to you? I mean, I mean it's, it's an obvious question. Every writer gets writer's block. Do you ever get hear of, of hearing that question, Fred? Um, to be completely honest with you, I find the question interesting mm. because, because um, I think writer's block is part of writing. Um, so even though you haven't answered the question – let me talk about it for a minute or two. Is that sure, okay? Sure, yeah. You know, I mean, I think process, when I talk to young writers, process is, 
is so integral. I mean, a lot of people think, okay, you just sit down at the at the word processor and you go, and the novel comes out or whatever. But I think, you know, I think that like understanding your habits and what opens up windows for you creatively is so is such a key to it. So, I mean, I I often speak about this idea of being inside the bubble and outside the bubble. Um, when you're inside the bubble. And what I mean by that is that the writing is really going well. You know, you go into the office every day or your study and the pages are coming. There's kind of a beauty there and you kind of fall into the illusion that's always going to be like that. But all writers, unfortunately, fall outside the bubble. And why might you fall outside the bubble? Well, maybe because, maybe because um, um, you took a vacation for two weeks or, you know, you got bored with writing and you put it down for two weeks. And then all of a sudden the writing that was coming so easily to you, it doesn't come so easily anymore. So that's when it becomes really interesting. Um, you know, how do you get back inside the bubble? And, and it, it's challenging, but also it speaks to potentially the greatness in the writing. Because like when you fall outside the bubble and you have to get back in, you can discover great things in the challenge of getting back into it. So I have all sorts of gimmicks that I do, you know, like I, I mean, I could tell you 20 gimmicks, but you know, I, but just to give you one or two, you know, if I can't, if I can't write anything, you know, I'll come up to my office and, you know, and I'll know that I have a lunch appointment at 1230 and, um, and I'll look at my word processor and I'll think, okay, I'll sit down. I've got two and a half hours, but I don't sit down there. I don't sit down at the word processor. I put on sports radio. I walk around I read the newspaper. I make a phone call and now it's an hour before I have to go for lunch. And I still don't go to the word processor. And then it's a half hour before lunch and I've got an appointment with a friend that I've been looking forward to and I turn on the machine and then I've got to write because if I don't write now, I'm beat. I've, I've blown the whole morning and somehow that impulsion of not writing and not writing kind of explodes into like some very, very interesting paragraphs that I have to write in 18 or 20 minutes. So that's one gimmick that I use. But again, writer's block is very important. I mean, we all feel it in one way or another. No, that, that's a great answer. And, 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 you know, one of the things that I have, you mentioned young writers, which, which was one of my questions down the road was, you know, I mean, I imagine young writers must have a ton of questions for you. But so, so if I limit you, so, I, so if I say to you, you know, Fred, um, I have a son, he, he really loves writing. He, you know, what are two pieces of advice you would give to him that are general, that are that are just, I mean, I've asked this question to other authors. They said, you know, write, 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 and just keep writing. Uh, be, write about something you're passionate about, which is which is obviously good advice. But what would you say if I said, you know, um, what's advice you give? And you hinted at this a little bit before, but what's a, what's strong advice to give to those young writers that that, that read your work and are, and, are, and, are, and are very taken back by it? Um, I'll tell you, Derek, it would, it would have to do with how old they were. You know, like if, you know, if, if someone, you know, if, if you know, if, 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 a, if a young teenager were asking me that question, I would just be very encouraging. I would be just very encouraging. I would say, you know, um, sit down and give it a try and write what you feel. And, you know, I, I, I might, I, I might, or I might read something that he wrote and I might make a suggestion of, of him coming at it from a different angle. But if an older young writer were to ask me that question, someone that was 20 years old or 21 years old or 22 years old and they were just graduating college or, or they had graduated college and they asked me, um, what should they do? How can they decide if this is what they want to do with their life? I would answer almost immediately that you, you probably shouldn't be a writer unless you can't help yourself <laughs> because, because it's such a tough thing to do. Right. I mean, I mean, it's, first of all, I mean, it's a very lonely profession. And you have to be very good at living in a room by yourself. I mean, if you're not good, I mean, I've known very talented writers, really talented writers, that can't be by themselves in a room. If you can't do that, you're never going to write anything that's any good. Right. And then, and then beyond that, I mean, there's so many good writers that don't make it, you know, that write pretty well, um, and they can't sell their work, or they have to spend years before they can sell their work, and then they finally sell their work, and they don't make any money to speak of. You know, so it's really... And this is, I guess, true about, I mean, I had, I had lunch yesterday with a, a very gifted actress, um, young, a young actress, and she was ruining the nature of her life today. I mean, going to, going to readings and getting turned down, and she's, I've seen her act, she's terrific. Mm. Um, you you got to want it so bad, because other than that, you know, it's, it's such a, a rough road. 
so that's what I would say. I mean, I like I, there was nothing else I wanted to do when I by the time I finished um, graduate school. That's all I wanted to do was be a writer. But if you don't feel that way, I think I think you do something else. No, that is so well said, and I'm glad you said acting. And I was even going to say to some degree. Uh, you know, podcasting, you know, everyone seems to have a podcast and, and I listen to half of these podcasts, not that I'm God's gift of podcasting, but um, I, I just feel like some people I listen to their, you know, podcasts and I wonder like, what's the motivation for this? Like, it, I feel like there's such an absence of heart, Fred. It's, it's like if I was to read somebody's writing who is kind of wanted to be a writer and kind of didn't like I, that point resonates with me. I mean, I, I'm certainly not in your class in the equivalent of podcasting as you are a writer, but your point resonates big time because, I mean, I get it. Like, if if you're not fully invested and you don't, you're not ready to make that commitment, same thing with acting. It, it's a long, dark, lonely road. For sure. And I like the use of your word heart. I mean, you know, if, if, if you don't have heart, your audience is going to be able to tell. Right. I mean, I mean, no matter what your art is, if, you, if, you just, if you're faking it, you don't have a chance. No, that that is so well said. And you know something, you before we get to your to your writing ability here. I mean, you, you go to Kenyon College in Ohio. You get your master's at NYU. Um, how big or how inspir? I'm not, I'm not inspirational. How how much of a factor did that play into the writer you are today, Fred? Or or, or was it mostly your experiences of just life that helped you out? Or is it a combination of both? Or I mean, I'll even add a third factor. Was there a mentor involved in your in your writing and who you are today as a writer? You know, I, 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 I was, um, I've always been kind of like a curious sort in that way. And so maybe relative to your question, I'm not a good example. Like, you know, like a lot of writer friends that, I, that I've known over the years uh, went to, um, you know, these, uh, these fellowship camps like Yaddo and McDowell, um, you know, where there would be other writers that would go for the summer and they would do work and, they, and they're part of, and, and, they're, and, and they jo- join writerly institutions and none of that worked for me for some reason. I mean, the only, the way, the way the writing career worked for me is I sort of had to fall into the illusion that I was the only one in the world doing it, which is, which is, I mean, ridiculous. I know it's completely ridiculous. I mean, you could say, why, why would you kid yourself like that? But it worked for me. I, I, I hated the idea of being like part of a big team of writers, you know, thousands of writers out there doing it and I'm among them. I like to pretend that I was sort of like in a cave by myself doing it. I, I didn't really have a great, um, a great mentor as a writer right. um, in, in school. I would say that I would say that in terms of like teaching, probably my mother was my greatest teacher. Right. In the sense that she was a great artist implicitly, and she laid all sorts of arts on me that I resented when I was young. I mean, she played progressive jazz to me when I was uh, t- eleven and twelve years old, and I hated it. And she laid. You know, and she laid Jack Kerouac on me when I was a little too young to understand it, but I sort of got into it, you know. And she was a great colorist in her work. So I learned about color and juxtaposition. She was probably my greatest mentor as a, as a, as a you know, as a, as a teacher. But I never had a teacher in school or graduate school that, um, that was particularly important to me as a writer. And frankly speaking, when I went to graduate school at NYU, um, it, you know, I... I was going, this was during the time of the Vietnam War, and I wasn't particularly interested in going to war. And, and I was in graduate school, and I knew I wanted to take a teaching job in college when I got out of it. But um, I was learning about the academics of criticism. And frankly, when I started writing fiction, after that, I had to unlearn a lot of stuff that I learned at NYU. Mm. And there was a certain way in which writing was taught academically that impeded me for a couple of years. So... That's that's just me. No, that that's a great answer, you know. And getting into your, you know, the, the work that I mean, I, I want to touch a little bit on on all of your your books here, but the very first one is one that <laughs> moved me beyond belief. And I remember reading it as I think it was, a, it was a sophomore in college, and boy, it blew me away. And there's no book quite like Searching for Bobby Fisher, and, and I feel like Fred, it's it's because you're writing about your son. It's almost like a journal. And it's almost like an autobiography. It's also like a it's it's a little bit of everything, but it's it's such an eclectic book. You can't really put I can't put my finger on what makes it so special, but there's a lot going on that just 
puts its hands around your heart and just and just doesn't let go. And I don't want to sound over the top, but that's about the only way I can describe it. Well, that's beautiful. I, I'm, I'm touched by it. I mean, I think maybe because it was a love affair. Mm. <laughs> you know, love affairs are very powerful to write about. And maybe this, and maybe that was it. I mean, I was, I was so in love. Well, of course, I was greatly in love with my son. But I was so in love with his art. And, the common, and I've always loved sports. You know, I've, I was, I've always been a sports fan freak. So the idea of having my own sports team built into my home was such an ecstasy to experience. Um, and maybe that's part of it. Um, I, you know, it, 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 was, uh, it was really a wonderful experience to live and a, and a wonder, wondrous experience to write about. And for those people that don't know, I mean, I think the release date was 1984. But before I get into the release date of this book, um, if I'm wrong on any of this, Fred, please correct me. Um, you were inspired by a 1972 Fisher Spassky match. Am I, am I right with that, or is that not correct? No, abso- a- absolutely. And so from there, you're inspired by that. You know, the book is about you know three years about you and your son Josh, who uh, to say he's a phenomenal chess player is probably a bit of an understatement. Um, you know, it's a bestseller. Uh, the movie was nominated for an Academy Award. Um, and, and you really are just very open and honest in this book. You know, there's a point where you feel like, um, and it's been a while since I've read this, so if I, mis- if I misquote you, please correct me. Um, you know, where you felt like you were pushing Josh um, perhaps a bit too hard. Um, it, it, do you still agree with that? Is that something you would w- would agree with? Or how, how do you still no, look I, at it? I absolutely agree with it. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, like um, we were a very, very unusual team. I mean, you know, when I, I when, um, before the book came out, uh, I wrote a, a cover piece for the New York Times Magazine that was titled, I think, John McEnroe's Father and Me. Um, <laughs> and, and what I was getting at was, you know, um, when, you, when your kid is so good at something, and Josh won, you know, eight, junior national championships, which is kind of remarkable. Right. Uh, um, you know, you lose, you lose focus about who's doing what. I mean, it seemed to me on a certain emotional level that I was winning all these championships. So when he, when he would lose, uh, I was devastated. And of course, I mean, you know, that's a dangerous thing when you have a, a young, he was so young, you know, to have your father so disappointed um, by the loss of a game. Um, so, I, you know, the... the I, but on the other hand, I recognized it was very human, and it, it was something that, like, um, that anyone in my position, in one way or another, would experience. So I wrote about it. It's always been my style, you know. Like I, I write, I write from the heart about whatever I do or whatever I think about, mm. because uh, that's the only way that writing interests me, frankly. No, Fred, and that's the way your writing comes across. I mean, it's never forced. You can tell you're coming from a place of of, of, of immense sincerity. It's not even, you know, it's 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 very obvious. You know, but you, you, the high stress, right? So I feel like, you know, for, for 20 years, I coached very competitive softball, very competitive basketball. I felt like um, a big detriment were the parents, right? So um, this, this movie hits me on a lot of levels. And, and I watch this movie, you know, years and years later, and I probably watch it once or twice a month. Um, and and, 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 I, and I, I'm overcome with emotion every time. But one of the other parts of the book that uh, that gets me emotional in another way is, is the parents, right? And because I can relate to not necessarily that high a level, but the parents almost ruining what's beautiful about the game slash the sport. And you saw a lot of that firsthand. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Was that a part that? Uh, what was your entire reaction when you look back on that? Was that tough to handle for you? Was it? Um, did you feel like? I don't know. Just kind of talk a little bit about that, if you would. Well, I mean, if you're talking about, was it tough to handle for me in terms of myself? Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me specify because, yeah, there's two types of stress. Like you wanting your son to do really well, but not that is, a, is certainly a question I, I want you to answer. But the, the way parents kind of can be over the top, like the movie, the, and I'll go to the movie, it portrays it as some of these parents are like, you know, almost to the point where, you know, they go over the top, the movie make, you know, the kids start clapping when the parents leave, but are the parent were the parents that far over the top? Were they? Oh, at- uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and still are today. You know, I mean, when, when I, when I made that, um, when I wrote that book, um, there were 400, um, children competing in, 
in our national championship when Josh was playing as an elementary student. And now there are about five or 6,000 kids that play in the national championship. Wow. So the sport, is, the sport has become significantly larger to some extent because of the movie and book. Um, but, but, but absolutely, yes. I mean, the parents become so deeply invested. I mean, I, I was having dinner. I was having dinner with, um, with, with, uh, actually with with Bruce Pandolfini, who's um, who was who's one of my closest friends, who's a character in the book. He was Josh's first chess teacher. Yes. Yeah. And he's he's portrayed by Ben Kingsley in the yeah. movie. Yeah. We were having dinner um, uh, the night before last, and he was telling me that one of his eight year old students, um, has four chess teachers, two grandmasters, an international master and himself. And each of these guys is paid, you know, 150 or $200 an hour to teach this eight year old kid. Wow. So just, so just think about this. I mean, the family is putting in, you know, eight or $900 a week to teach chess to an eight year old kid. That's all right. You know, I mean, not spectacular, maybe, maybe better than all right, maybe good, but not spectacular. Why? Because obviously for the parent, it means so much. It, it's just, it's, isn't it the same story really as, as these actors that we've read about recently that, that, that have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to get their kids into um, fancy colleges mm, to inflate mm. their college board scores? Because they do this obviously because they feel ennobled themselves, even though it's a fraud, you know? I mean, it, it, the projection that parents have relative to their children is really wild. No, that is so well said. And, and, and do you think, Fred, I mean, and, and I'm probably answering my own question here, doesn't it take away from the beauty and the genuine, like when I watched that movie or, or I, when I read your book, there's such a, like a, even though the parents are over the top, there's such a beautiful, just, I don't, it's just so genuine, it's so authentic, there's something just so beautiful about, you know, the game, the sport, you know, you know, same with baseball and so forth, but there's something really beautiful in your book and, and in the movie that's almost lost. Like when I hear that story, you just tell me about, you know, four or five tutors. It's almost lost. It's almost like now we're kind of going down a different road and we're approaching it for different, different reasons. Yeah, it's true. You know, it's true. I think, I think it's very, very easy for um, a parent to cross over the line. Um, you know, we, we've all heard these, heard the phrase stage parent, but I don't think anybody real, most people don't, they haven't lived that life don't realize how powerful it is. I mean, for a stage parent, um, the, the father and mother actually have a chance to reclaim glory that they felt that they never quite achieved themselves. Mm. And so they're, they're willing to go to desperate ends to achieve it. Um, it's, it's, really, um, it's really remarkable, and I think it happens all over in all sports. Yep, yep. Um, I, just, I, I was just writing about my little world <laughs> yeah, and your little world is, is absolutely wonderful to read about and, and hear about. And, and you mentioned um, uh, you mentioned Bruce Pandolfini. You know, one thing I don't get, and maybe you can help me with this, I've heard you call him a phenomenal person. I've heard other call him a wonderful person. I heard Steve Zalian call him a wonderful person. And then in the movie, they portray him as a little bit of a, of a nut. Like, I don't understand that. And, and Steve Zalian is like, yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. I, I, there's, you won't meet a nicer human being. He's so phenomenal with kids. And then you, you, you watch Ben Kingsley's performance, and it's like, and obviously I'm, I'm, I'm stretching because you're the author of the book. I mean, you, you didn't do the casting and so forth, but I, I don't get that. Fred, did you ever hear an answer for that, why, they, why he was painted that way? Um, I, I, I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> I mean, I, I, ne I never liked Ben Kingsley's portrayal of Bruce. I mean, I, I thought it was the weakness in the movie. Because first of all, Bruce is not like that at all. I mean, he's a sweetheart. He's right. really a lovely person. And I... I don't know. I mean, you know, Steve Steve's Alien made it, made a very very fine movie. You know, I'm, I'm I'm you know a lot of a lot of books are screwed up in the in the movie retelling, and I think Searching for Bobby Fischer is a is a lovely film. But I, I don't like the portrayal portrayal of Bruce Pendleton in that in that movie, and I've and I've said it many times. Right, right. Bruce is, not, Bruce, Bruce is not like that. No, no, no. And, and I've read that. And the one thing I love about the movie is I think it it it, it does that. I, it captures the heart of your book. I think it captures the, the 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 family dynamic to to a certain degree. I think it captures the the, the love and innocence. I mean, there's a really beautiful. I think that's the common thread which makes it special. Obviously, there's stuff 
that is not accurate, but that's that's Hollywood. But um, when you watch the movie, right? Are you? And I've heard you comment on this. Comment on this, but are you? Are, are you happy with it? Let me ask you this: Is there a part of the movie that you absolutely love? Well, first of all, I haven't watched the movie now in probably five years or four years. Wow! So it would be it would be interesting to watch it again, and I will at one point. Right. Maybe maybe with my grandson, I'll watch it one day. Okay. Um, I I, uh, I I've written about this in different venues. Um, I you know my first response to the movie was I, I didn't like the movie when I first saw it. Right. Because like it it was a different vision than than the vision I portrayed in the book, and then. You know, and then I saw it three years later, and I liked it more. And then I saw it three years after that, and I said, "Hey, this is a nice movie." Mm. Um, it, it was it was Steve's rendering of my vision, and and it's a, it's a lovely film. Um, but I had my own evolution coming to that. Yeah, and that's well said. And the one thing I I never understood is there. But let me ask you: Is there a scene when you watch it? I mean, I know it's been a while, but is there a scene that you like? you feel that Steve kind of got right that was portrayed in your book that you're like, you know what? Yeah, that's, that's, I like, I like the, I like the, um, I like the, uh, what just came to me. I, I, it's not that I've been thinking about this, but what just came to me is this great scene where Joey Allen says to, uh, Bruce Pandolfini to Ben Kingsley, um, to get out of the house, get out of the house. Yeah. He throws him out of the house. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Passion. And that was a beautiful scene. Yeah. And also another scene was where, you know, where Joe Montaigne confronts the teacher who who uh, who, who refers to chess as um, well, some other board game. What was it? I don't, you remember? I can't recall. You know, and he, 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 he spoke to her with such derision and irony. That was a beautiful scene. Yeah, Those are the yeah. That I think of it. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the one thing I never understood was, you know, um, Bobby Fischer had this ridiculous take on what he thought the movie was, but you almost with Bobby Fischer, I, th- I feel like Fred, you have to separate the man from the chess player because I feel like the chess player was brilliant, uh, and we're all flawed as people, but I feel like the man, when it comes to to, to Fischer, was just uh, coming from a place of that I'll never understand. Well, I I I, I agree with you. I mean, I. Whenever I've talked about Bobby, I make that separation between his genius as an artist. Uh, he was, he was, you know, one of the best two chess players that's ever lived, um, if not the best. And um, and his point of view is anti-Semitism, is his hatred, which is reprehensible. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I've always, I, you know, where this, this, I have a feeling this conversation could go on for two and a half or three hours. Um, we could talk about. You know Bobby Fischer for for the next hour together, but just to say to, to, just to say in a in a sentence, I mean you know he he uh, he, he was such a crackpot and, and such a genius. I mean, but there have been a lot of people like that, like 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 T. S. Eliot was an anti semite, but he was such a wonderful poet. Sure. A lot of people like that. Yep. No, I, I completely agree. And you know one of, and I got to say, you know, you and I could talk about what the film got right, what it got wrong. You know, you. But the one thing you can't argue is is the film is an absolute it pays absolute tribute to Bobby Fischer's ability as a as a chess player and for him to have thought it was anything but a compliment or, or you know is is pure insanity. I mean I, that's just where I'm coming from on that. I I, I, don't, I don't understand where he was coming from on that. Oh, I agree. Yeah. So I have to ask you one of the other beautiful things and one of the other beautiful things I saw in your interviews with because in many of your other books that and we're gonna talk about in a bit. Um, that you that you promoted over the years. Um, um, your son Josh is with you, and I and I have to say, Fred, I've been dying to tell you this. I find the rapport that the two of you have uh, nothing short of of beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I Thank mean, you. he he clearly is enamored with you, and he he thinks the world of his dad. And and, and I got to tell you, as as somebody who just lost his dad, I, I can appreciate that. And I and I, and I'm oh, almost to, 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 I'm almost jealous of it. I mean, I. I think it's such a wonderful thing to see in our society today. Thank you. Yeah, Thank so, you. it's true. Yeah, one of the other things... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was just saying I'm sorry for your loss. No, I appreciate that. And, and one of the things that I have to say, and, and, I, and I, I've been dying to ask you this as well, um, the chess in the parks, right? Because I, I feel like your son... And, and I wasn't... I, I wanted to ask you this because I feel like the film did show it, but I feel like... And I, and I remember reading it, and I can't remember... You know, I, I'm a little unclear on this. 
was there a conflict between what Bruce wanted, the style and philosophy? You know, you and I, we talk, you're clearly a sports fan, and, you know, we talk about styles with coaches and players. Was there a fundamental philosophy difference between what your son was doing in Washington Square and what Bruce was, was, was teaching him? Well, yes and no. I mean, jo- I mean jo- Josh learned to play in Washington Square Park, and, you know, and he, and he, and he, was, he was intrigued by the, the game the chess hustlers play that was, for the most part, unsound. And Bruce wanted him to be a great tournament player. So there was a certain muted conflict between the, w- the, the way Bruce wanted to teach Josh the classical chess and the way that Josh liked to, to play the kind of like hustling chess that he learned in Washington Square Park. And ultimately, as he got a little bit better, um, you know, he, 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 he became a great tournament player. He could never have won championships if he, if he played the way chess hustlers play in Washington Square Park. He would have had a limitation. So yes, early on when he was seven years old, they had a kind of quiet conflict. But, you know, Bruce was a sweetheart, and he knew, and he recognized that at the same time that Josh had to learn the classical game, that he didn't want to kill off the killer spirit in jo- and Josh and the, and the, and the, and the competitive joie de vivre that he learned in Washington Square Park. So it was a question of, like, as a b- brilliant teacher, he was able to embrace both I- ideas. Right. And it, was any of it, though, Fred, was any of it about the experience? Like, Josh just loved being there with those people playing chess. Like, I mean, forget, the, you know, the philosophy, forget the technique, forget all that. I mean, being outside, being with those people playing chess, I'm sure he was enamored. I'm sure people were like, wow, he's he's clearly got ability. I mean, part of it had for a boy that age to, to, to pe- you know, it had to be the experience of just being with other people out there and, and doing his thing. Um. Yeah, I mean, he, he loved it. It, it. You know, from the age of, actually it was six, from the age of six to, six to eight, it was a way of life. I loved it too. It was such fun going to the park and playing, and, you know, and it was beautiful being outside there and the squirrels were running all over and the people were watching. It was, it was terrific. And I thought that Stanley Kubrick kind of played there. I thought I read where he played in that same park. That was before our time, but yes. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the other thing is your son has taken up, and I just want to touch on your son a little bit here, he's taken up martial arts, he's taken up surfing. Um, is he just, is, does this, he, he just loves, he loves challenges. I mean, he just loves, and he's a well-thought-out kid. He knows his thing. You know, it's it's amazing how he embraces things and how he's so well-thought-out, Fred. Yeah, he's, he's, he's you know, I, it's very easy to fall into a into a language of superlatives talking about Josh because you know he won the world world championship as, as a martial artist, came in second place in the world championship as a chess player. Wow! Um, he, he surfs at a very high level today. He became a black belt belt in Brazilian jiu jitsu. He's um, he's a very very gifted guy, but he's a sweetheart. He's a great. He's he's a generous, thoughtful, soulful person. I mean. He's, he's a really great person, apart from his com- accomplishments. Yeah, and, and, and it's clear, if, if anybody ever wants to see the rapport that you guys have, it's, it's phenomenal. But I'll tell you, if something else that's phenomenal is the book that was released on 528, uh, Deep Water Blues. I was not expecting this, Fred. Not that I was you know, expecting a certain type of book, but it's it's there's a lot to read here. I mean, there's a lot going on. I mean, it's it's a fun read. It's not... It's very, you know, it's interesting. It gets captivating. Um, I got to tell you, I love the book. So how, why did? So let me ask you now. Why did? What, what surprised you? Tell me. Tell me what. I was not expecting. You, like, you. Yeah. So I mean, I, I want to be careful with my words here because I, don't, I, I think people should buy it. and I don't want to give away anything. I was not expecting so much. Um, Maybe because I, you know, we, you and I harped on Bobby Fisher for a while, and, and I know some of your other books kind of. They're not all like that, but I was. It was a little bit. Um, if it, let, let me put it this way: so if it was a movie, it would certainly be an awesome. Like I could see somebody buying the rights to this. It would be a phenomenal action movie. Like there's a lot here. The characters are, are fantastic. Bobby Little. I mean, I, I don't know. There's a lot going on here that I I just I couldn't pull away from. I I loved it. I think I finished it in I want to say four and a half five hours. I absolutely loved it. Like there's. I don't know that I was expecting this much action, like this much. I, I, I probably lacked, lacked the vernacular to, to properly describe it, but I mean, I loved it. I, I would, I, I can't recommend this book enough. 
Well, I'm delighted. Let me tell you the secret. Okay. You know, um, the, the, the book, the book is, is, um, is, uh, it, is inspired by a true story. And it's a story that I knew about for a lot of years. And, and I, I tried to write it a few times, and I, I didn't like how, how it was sounding, because every time I tried to write it, it was too complicated. It was, you know, I was psychologizing too much. I just couldn't get the tone of it right. And Josh, who knew the story, kept saying to me, Dad, just sit down and write the novel. And I'd sit down, and I didn't like it. And then what happened was about three years ago, um, I wrote a screenplay. It's the first screenplay I've ever written. And, um, and I had to learn how to write a screenplay, and I, I, I threw myself into it. And it's a cool story. I don't want to talk about it now because there's too many things to talk about. Mm -hmm. But the work on the screenplay helped me incredibly. Right. I mean, it opened up a whole different style of writing to me. And then when I approached, when I, when I, when I approached Deep Water Blues again, I just knew how I wanted to do it. I wanted it to be one scene after the next, hardly any flashbacks, no philosophizing, very, very fa fast pace, um, quick pictures, action. I wanted to write it so that it moved and that it was powerful and it was sharp and it was fast. And writing the screenplay, you know, kind of helped, helped get, gave me the vision of how to write the book. And so it was, so you're right. Your perception is exactly right. It's different than anything I've ever written before. And it kind of excites me. It kind of like opened up a whole new writing possibility for me. No, and, and I think Netflix, if you're listening, or Prime or Hulu, if you're listening, this would make a phenomenal uh, either series or, you know, because here we go, you know, there's, and I'm not, I'm, I'm going to try not to say too much here, you know, it turns out, you know, you have this beautiful island and, you know, it turns out control of a dock and then all of a sudden there's just simple it's just chaos. It's and the characters are all well thought out, and you know the idea that you know this beautiful paradise gets. Uh, I'm probably saying too much. Gets turned on its head pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, I, I loved it, Fred. I, I thought this was a fantastic book. I'm, I'm so thrilled, man. It makes me very happy. So, so now, oh, how? Thanks uh, so much. Talk about this. Or, I mean, I thought I saw something on the internet. You're going to be at a was it a bookstore? I read it was in the beginning of June. I thought. Now, how are you going to promote? Talk about how you're going to promote this. Are you going to go? Do you go like to a Barnes and Noble or a bookstore and, and, and read a couple pages? How does that work? Well, you know, I'm having, uh, you know, I'm having a book signing um, at at Shakespeare and Company. Um, there's a hotel that they have, and um, it's on 79th Street, and it, 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 it's a two, it's too, it will be too big an event to hold in the bookstore, so they'll have it in, a, in, a, in an attendant. Um, Hotel, and I will post. I'll, I'll post the exact information with the address on on the internet. So if anyone was interested, they could check it out that way. I can't give you the address right now. It's not a secret. I just don't have it in front of me. Right. But but um, but yeah. What what it'll be basically is that I'll I'll read from the book for ten or twelve minutes, and then I'll answer questions and I'll sign books, and it'll be a cool event. Yeah, and I just wanted to uh, say. Yeah, I wanted to say here before I forget. You know. Um, you know. It is absolutely an easy read. And when I say easy read, I mean the book doesn't drone on and on. It's exactly what you said. It's action. It's it's captivating. It's everything you want when you open a book up. It's everything you want. I mean, and that's I, I had to say that before you before you finish your sentence. Thank you so much, man. I'm moved. I'm, I'm so pleased that, that you liked it. That's great. It makes me happy. Yeah, so I mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but are you already thinking to, on to the next project? Are you... What's what's you mentioned the screenplay? I'm not going to ask you about that, but is there something that's you know are are you always thinking of the next thing? Is that how your mind works when it comes to writing? You know, I'm one of these unlucky authors that, and I wish I wasn't this way. That like when I'm writing something, I'm all in on it, and then when I finish, you know, I think, oh my god, what am I going to do with my life from this point? And I usually don't have the next thing to do because, like, I'm so involved with the book that I'm writing that that either maybe it's my limitation of intelligence that I can't be, like, planning the next event when I'm doing the first event, you know? And so, like, what happens is that I just, you know, it's been my experience between books that for three or four or five or sometimes six months after the book, I feel like I'm going through a very lonely period of self-discovery until I find something else that seizes my imagination. I've never, I've never been the kind of writer that could just write about anything. You know, like, 
I think you alluded at the beginning of the interview, but when I finished graduate school, after a short period of time trying to write fiction, which was unsuccessful, when I was like 22 or 23, I spent, I spent about 10 years writing feature ch- journalism for large magazines. Um, and I turned down pieces that didn't excite me many times. Like a big magazine would offer me a piece to write. And if it didn't engage my imagination, I said, no, thanks. And that's the way I am about books. I can't imagine writing one unless I'm, you know, so turned on by it that I can, that I just want to put it in, work on it body and soul for the next two or three years. So like between books is a tough time for me personally. I walk around, I, I annoy my family saying, I'm never going to have a next book to write. What am I going to write next? And then hopefully, luckily, if the guards are with me, I discover a story that inspires me and then I'm off again. So, no, I wish I, I could tell you I know what the next book is, but I don't have it yet. And, and I have two final questions for you. You've been so kind that I'm embarrassed that it's taken me 45 minutes to say this to you. You are, for, for those of you listening that don't know, uh, Fred, you are a huge fisherman, right? Fishing has been a huge part of your life since you were a child. Yeah, I am. Yeah, and I, I, feel, just... I feel so bad I've taken this long. I mean, and, and a lot of it resonates like your father in the books that you write, right? So talk about your, your, your love for fishing. You know, like my dad, my dad bought me a, fish, a little fishing rowboat when I was 13 years old. I think I mentioned at the beginning of our interview that, you know, that when I was, um, that my, that my first attachment to writing came through fishing. That's right. In the that's sense right. That I read The Old Man in the Sea and I decided that writing and fishing were linked. And I, I've always sort of felt that on some level, even though most of my writing is not about fishing. Right. But, but you know, I, I, um, when I lost my father, soon after I lost my father, I, I started buying fishing boats of my own. And, and now I own a, you know, a 40-foot, it's an older boat, it's, it's 40 years old. I own it a, a, that I keep in Florida, and I fish with my friends and my family. And, um, and it's just um, bliss for me to be out, of, out in the ocean and... You know, there, were, there was a period of time when I was a younger man that I was a tournament fisherman. I fished with my wife a lot. She's a great fisherman. We won many tournaments, really big tournaments. But I'm not that way anymore. I don't care about catching a lot of fish. I just like to go on the ocean and, and troll my lures and watch them in the water. And frankly, fishing for me now is more than catching fish. It's kind of a meditation. Just being out there and being on the sea and watching the baits. I just love it so much. Sometimes I even run away from fish. Because it kind of like impedes the beautiful, the beauty of the meditation. Huh. But it's it, it's something I've done my whole life, and I really love. Yeah, and, and I always felt that way too. From from reading your from reading you know your, your your from your website and so forth, I always felt like fishing was just more than just catching fish for you, right? Because and that's why I bring it up. You know, you did hint at it early on in, in the interview, but I almost felt like Fred exactly what you just said. Like it almost takes on another meaning with you. It's very. It's, it's ingrained in you. Like, my dad loved fishing, but it wasn't just catching fish or, you know, throwing them back. It was just, it's, there's something deeper. And I think a lot of the, you know, fly, I mean, uh, what comes to, I'm, I'm a movie guy, so I think movies first. I almost think a river runs through it a little bit, right? Beautiful. Fly That's fishing, right? So, novel too. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. absolutely. And I think about that when you just said that. I was like, it's, you said meditation. I almost think spiritual. It's It's, it's got another level to it. And I'm so happy to see that you're that passionate, you know? Yeah, well, I, I, I'll tell you a funny little little story as we're getting close to the end of it. You know, like like my grandson has a, who's seven years old, and I I just love him to death. His name is Jack Waitskin, and he has um, a great love of animals and fish, and and every time um, he knows that I go fishing, he gets very emotional because the idea of my pulling, as he puts it, these little fishes fishies out of the sea, <laughs> is just more, more than he can he can bear. Right, and um, and one day he came to my office and he said to me, I can't believe that you do that, Baba. That's what he calls me, Baba. How can you pull those little fish out of the sea? You should let them swim around. And since he said that to me, I have to admit, I have to admit it's killed off a certain amount of my ardor for taking fish out of the sea. <laughs> so more and more I just let them go, even if they're good to eat, and I just go out there and fish for them, but I try to leave them in the ocean, mostly for Jack now. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And my very last question to you is you mentioned sports. Are you a Mets, Jets guy, a Rangers guy? What's the sport that really that your your hook line hook line and sinker I, I'm, involved? I am in? such I am such a Met and Jets fan. You can't imagine like crazy. Like I ch- I check on them all 
in the off season, I'm checking on them every day in the off season. I watch all the games. Oh, I don't watch all the Mets games. I, I, wa- I watch the Mets games if they're winning. If they're losing, I turn them off because I don't want to be depressed for the rest of the night. But I follow them very closely. And I, 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 you know, and I, I used to be a big Knicks fan, but they've been so bad for so long that you know, I've stopped watching them. But, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a big sports fan. And I think the Jets in for a big year. Le'Veon Bell, they have a lot of good talent. Um, exciting. Yes. So exciting. Yes, yes. Uh, his name is Fred Waitskin. Fred, I can't thank you enough. You gave me almost an hour of your time today. You're, you're, I, I could listen to you talk, like you said, for hours. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I love this. It's, it's been a great conversation. Thank you very much. You're great at what you do. Thanks, Fred. Is Josh falling behind in his schoolwork? He is, but I'm more concerned about other things, like his friendships. There's a problem there? Uh, there could be. Well, is there or isn't there? Mr. Waitskin... I'm, I'm sure he's very good at this chess thing, but that isn't really the issue. Chess when thing. I'm, I'm sorry. Chess thing. I'm sure he's very good at it, but it worries me. If I could make an analogy. Chess thing. If it was like, say, oh, I don't know, um, cards. <laughs> Pinochle. Pinochle. For instance. Pinochle. Fred. Bonnie, he's comparing chess to Pinochle. What am I supposed to say to that? Mm. She's trying to make a point. Maybe we should listen. Vinny thinks he's spending too much time in it, too. Vinny? Vinny's a drug addict. I'm supposed to listen to his opinion, too? I'm sorry, but your analogy is a very bad one. If you want to make a comparison to something, compare it to something that makes sense. Compare it to math or music or (sighs) art, because otherwise it belittles him and it and me. No, I don't mean to belittle you at all. Oh, but you are. You are. Uh, even in the way you're looking at me. Mr. Waste, can I think perhaps... You want to know how good he is? I'll, I'll tell you how good he is. He is better at this than I have ever been at anything in my life. He is better at this than you'll ever be at anything. My son has a gift. He has a gift. And once you acknowledge that, then maybe we'll have something to talk about. <laughs>